party outside City Council on January 27th. And we're inviting people to come give public comment and talk about how this matters to them. So, um, yeah, thanks for your time. And we hope to see you either at Fletcher Free Library at 6 p.m. on Tuesday, 21st, or at 6 p.m. in front of City Hall on the 27th. Did you miss anything? No, you got everything. Okay, maybe. Thanks. Good night, good evening, good evening, good night. I just, uh, I guess, event announcement for this weekend for children and families at the Echo Center. And uh, the 20th of this month is MLK Day, and the uh, Echo Center is hosting an event that starts around 10 and ends around 5. There is a podcast that will be hosted through a lot of the other different organizations. I myself represent the Fans Family Farm as a collaborative artist, so this is a in course uh, as an event to know, we're looking for anything to do with family, children, and family related, the Echo Center, the 20th of January, 2020. Happy New Year, guys. Those of you that might be interested in what the Public Works Department does and what the Public Works Commission is all about, um, I can give you a hand up and I can just answer any questions. And you're welcome to come to the meetings Wednesdays, third Wednesdays, which is next Wednesday. Thanks. All right, any other announcements? Questions, comments, suggestions? Okay, well, one thing that I forgot to mention, um, but everyone's been doing a pretty good job with mics today, is a little bit of um, microphone etiquette, microphone usage, is um, we usually will hand you the microphones turned on, but if they're not turned on, there's just a little switch here that you can turn off. Turn on. And um, when you're speaking into a microphone, it's really best to hold it directly in front of your mouth. Um, you want to hold it like a rapper, not really like a newscaster. Um, and pretty close to your mouth is like a good way to do it. Um, and I would like to give you a little bit of a time frame. I mentioned earlier that we have some extra funding available, $2,500 for each ward. That means total there's 5,000, but each ward gets to decide 2,500, what they want to do with it. And how we're going to try to do this process is we would like you to submit an application by February 1st. Um, you can either turn it into an NPA steering committee member or you can email it to us. Our email is on the paper here. It's also on our website. If you Google Ward 2 and 3 Burlington NPA, it will come up. Um, and what we are thinking of doing is that at the next NPA meeting, the people who have applied can, will do a presentation um, about their project that they would like funding for, and then we will vote on it in March. Um, and we also will be um, figuring out what to do with the extra funds, um, which could go towards buying some more AV equipment for our meetings. Um, or going towards food donations to cover any more expenses or if we need any more kitchen equipment. Um, and so the next, uh, next step on our agenda is the city councilors, um, Max Tracy, Brian Pine, and Perry Freeman. Hey, here we go. Hello, hello. 
Hello, hello. That's how Zappa started the microphone when he shows. So, um, the annual city election, I just want to make sure folks know, March 3rd. It is uh, 7 a.m. to 7 p.m. And um, some of us stand there for 12 hours straight. Maybe a little break. We'll see. Um, so, please come and say hello. And participate um, at least that way. And hopefully more. Um, we're going to just touch on a couple of, um, of the ballot questions that you'll be um, seeing on the ballot for this election. I will just try and um, speak to one of them, and Max and Carrie can uh, help do the other. Um, I should confess I'm going to leave earlier than normal because my son is leaving to go back to college, and I told him I would spend some time with him tonight, so that's, I just have to confess. Um, the Housing Trust Fund is a uh, locally we basically agreed to tax ourselves about 30 years ago, and it was a pretty narrow vote. It was actually about 200 votes in favor on, uh, well, the margin was about 200 votes citywide. Um, but we added a penny to the tax rate in 1989, and to sort of try and get through the, the technical reasons for this, I'll just say, over time, that tax rate has decreased from a penny because it is, by our charter, cannot go up with inflation. That's just a simple way to describe what's happening. But we're basically going to restore that to a full penny and lock it in going forward that it will grow as inflation grows so that therefore more revenue comes into that housing trust fund. And you might ask, what exactly is a housing trust fund? It's a local pot of money that is used to create permanently affordable homes for low-income people. Um, it has, by, by ordinance, it has to serve at least 20, I think 20 or 25 percent, must go to people that are very low income, um, below 30 percent of median. So um, I can't do the math right here, but I'll just say that that's reaching folks that normally need some sort of um, ongoing rental assistance to be able to afford their rent. Uh, and then for home ownership, the target is more in the 50 percent of median income area. So it's Habitat and Champlain Housing Trust homes receive the bulk of the money. Some of the money also goes to COTS to run the way station and um, to also run something called the Housing Resource Center. And a little bit goes to um, Home Share Vermont to be able to provide home shares for people who I would say are maybe overhoused who want to add someone to their home and there's a home share relationship. Um, that's sort of simplifying the relationship, but that's really what home share does. So that, that's how the money gets used. Um, I think it's really something that we have to support because the federal government has retreated, and this, this started 30 years ago because the federal government turned its back on poor people, and especially funding for affordable housing at the federal level was shrinking rapidly. And this was an attempt at the local level to try and make up for some of that. It doesn't come anywhere close to the, to the considerable dollars it used to flow in cities like Burlington, but it is a, um, a local way to help to alleviate a piece of the housing um, crisis for so many folks. And uh, you might know this, but it's worth pointing out that half the renters in Burlington, roughly around half, are um, still what we call rent burden. They're still paying more for their rent than the federal guidelines suggest they should. So that's, what, that's where rent burden comes in. Um, unfortunately, about a third are severely rent burdened, which means they're paying more than half their income for rent. So um, this continues to be an incredibly challenging issue, and the Housing Trust Fund is one tool we have available to address it and to try and uh, ameliorate what I think is largely a, a market failure that will never, you know, through, without, without some intervention from the public sector, um, it does, we're not closing that gap. So this is where we close that gap. So that's right. Yep. Should we stop and take questions on that, or should we just do them all? Questions on that? Yeah. Have they decided the language of the ballot? Microphone, The question is, has the language actually been defined? It probably has. I think we did approve language. Um, I will um, defer to, um, I don't have the language in front of me, but it will hopefully be in a way that people can read it and pretty easily understand what it says. So, so the way that it works is that we hold a number of public hearings in January um, about as part of the charter change process. Um, at those, the public is welcome to provide feedback, and we are able to make changes to the to what's being proposed based on what the public provides to us. After that time, and later this month, we do adopt what's called the short form language, 
that is that easy to understand language, but there is at each polling place the full actual text of, of it available, so you can go and you can bring it with you in the voting booth if you haven't had a chance to read over it prior to town meeting day and get a chance to look at any of the any of these questions in full. Um, they're also you know all all available on the city website prior to election as well. And if you have questions about it, then we can certainly. Yeah, that's a good point. And we do have a final public hearing on these ballot questions on January 27th at 7 p.m. at City Council, where we will take comments and questions and try to answer folks. And if we need to make adjustments to make them, um, uh, to fine tune them, we will do that at that point. Um, by the way, petitions for anyone who wants to run for any office are due on that day as well, the 27th. And then there will be a final um, annual city meeting ballot item meeting where we basically again go over what the ballot questions are on the 26th of February contest auditorium at um, uh, 5 p.m. on that day. Those other hands back there. Oh, well, listen, yeah. Look, you know what I mean. Um, yeah. So just for if, <laughs> the, the clear numbers, I have the clear numbers from, um, from the housing for the the penny, penny for affordable housing, and I think this really needs to be clear for people. Um, and I think in in this war, in this NPA meeting, people get it. But I went to another NPA meeting and people didn't. But just to be clear, what the numbers are for your your taxes going up for this, to be very clear, if your house is worth two hundred and thirty thousand dollars. Your taxes are going to go up twelve dollars and forty-two cents a year for this affordable housing um, trust. If your house is worth four hundred thirty-nine thousand dollars, it's going to go up forty-three dollars. And if your house is worth, bless you, if your house is worth six hundred eight thousand dollars, it's going to go up sixty dollars. So we're not talking a big amount of money, but I just want. I want anyone who's doing this to make those figures, um, and those figures were presented at the, um, what what was the thing that the mayor did in, in September? The housing summit. So they were very clearly presented in those numbers. Um, so I think it's really important, because the wording is probably not going to be simple, that that gets across for whoever is doing that, that it's that simple. Thank you. Any other questions? Okay, so we can move on to the next question that will be on the ballot uh, in March, and that's a change to the, the availability of the local ballot. We talked about this a little bit last time, um, but basically in for um, the elections where there's a state and a local ballot available, it's kind of rare, it doesn't happen all that often. It happens in like primary years, like, or like a federal ballot or a state ballot, and then you also have a city ballot. The way that it works currently is that you have, um, the state ballot needs to be available 45 days before the election, whereas the local ballot only needs to be available about 28 days before the election. And so what happens is that if someone requests a ballot uh, as an absentee prior to that, um, before the, um, the city ballot is ready, what happens is that they get sent a federal ballot first, they fill it out and they can send that in, but then they also get sent a city ballot at the same, at, after the fact. And so what happens is that a lot of times people are confused, um, they'll forget to send back the city ballot, they'll think they've already voted, they think they, they don't want to vote twice or something like that. And so what will end up happening is that we see just uh, different rates of response between people who have requested um, the, uh, in terms of the federal ballot versus the state ballot. So what this change would allow us to do is to essentially push back, would, would push back the, the, the availability of the city ballot so that that would be available at the same time. It would have to be available already essentially earlier in the process. 40, that 45 day time period, so that we could then be able to send both ballots all the time at the same time for folks who requested them. So that would, that's that particular change. Is that going to mean that we have less time to get signatures on petitions if we're running for city office? So in the, yes, it would. <laughs> 
it, it would in a, in a sense, but it wouldn't go into effect until the following year. So you would know, we would know that in, a, in advance, but it wouldn't move it out because like for instance, like Brian said, the date is now the 27th. So it's, yeah, so it's like the end of this month for, um, uh, for time meeting day, which takes place first Tuesday of March. This pushes it back earlier. About two weeks earlier, yeah. A little bit more than that, but yeah. Yeah, petition yeah, petition signatures for ballot items as well as elected officials too. Uh, Max, I'm not on school board, but last time someone mentioned the school board and how that could be a problem, did you look into that? Yeah, so we're still working with the city attorney to understand the ramifications of that issue. Um, the city attorney is going to have to provide feedback on that, and if in fact we do find that, that's where that provision, um, where the public hearing comes into play. So if we do find that there is a conflict where we really wouldn't be able to accommodate the need for the school budget, um, we would be able to make that change. Um, and we can also still decide to, to not include these on the ballot um, in, the, in the end, but um, that would essentially be... Um, something that we do still need to kind of make absolutely certain because that was something that was mentioned kind of after we had gone through committee deliberations and it hadn't come up and thankfully it was raised so hopefully we'll be able to figure that aspect of it out just to explain what that meant is i think the schools need time because the tax department at the state level notifies the school districts what their common level of appraisal is and stuff that really affects what the tax rate will be and they get that usually in january i mean they get it so late that this will present challenges unless that changes so that process would need to change at the state level in order to help municipalities so. and just so i'm clear this will be the case the date will be the same whether or not there is it'll be the same if every year it won't depend the election um, it won't depend on what election is right, do we have an idea of how much we have an idea of how much voting will go up and the um, due this are we talking five percent increase of ballots of people voting participating I think, it was, not confused. I think it was more than that in terms of like people who sent in their state ballots versus their city ballots. I can't remember the exact percentage, but it was certainly higher. It was enough to be like that. that that's Statistically really significant. Yeah. I, I don't know the exact number. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Brian, you said that you would like to see more of this type of thing. Is there anything else on that one? Okay. Um, the non-citizen voting and local elections. So this um, allows. Um, for a certain sort of group of non-citizens, so that would be people who have, um, you know, permanent residents who have a green card. Um, I think there was some questions last time around, um, or an at Charter Change Committee around concerns that this would create a, like a list, um, a separate list of people that, um, but that was addressed by the ACLU of Microjustice who, um, informed us that those lists of course already exist and those, these, you know, these folks are already sort of known to um, government agencies already. So, um, yeah, that would give, expand voting rights to um, yeah, people with green cards and, and permanent residents and residents. Sorry, I'm a little hoarse. I, I'm under the weather. Were there any questions on that? The wording on our ballot for this, is it similar to what might be on the ballot in Lewinsky or other communities that are considering this? I mean, just to avoid confusion statewide, or does it even matter? Yeah, I, I think it's going to be pretty similar um, in terms of the short form language. The, I think the verbiage that we settled on in terms of how to refer to folks who would be eligible is something along the lines of uh, resident uh, resident non-citizens uh, or I, I think that was sort of permanent resident non-citizens was sort of the, the language that was there to eliminate any confusion that might, people might have and it's just important that folks are really clear about that um, with with people that were just giving good information to voters because 
Um, the lot, this did come up a couple of years ago. It was voted down, and I think one of the reasons that it, it was voted down is because of this information, basically saying that you know anybody would be able to, to vote that, and people not really feeling like um, that was the case. So I think that we really need to be clear at what is and isn't taking place here with this, um, just so that folks have are are, are really speaking about what, and voting on what, what actually is on the ballot. Any other questions about non-citizen voting in local election? I'll ask again, do we have percentages for people who are currently not voting that we expect to see uh, if this proposal is passed? It's always hard to say how many people will actually turn out, but I think it was the, the number of, of folks who would qualify to vote was in the thousands. I think it was several thousand uh, permanent resident non-citizens who would be eligible to vote. Um, which I think would be a great thing to just get them involved in, in the further involved in our political processes. I think a lot of folks already are, but they just don't have that additional opportunity to come to the, 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 the to come and vote on town meeting day. So I'd really like for them to be able to to be to at least have that option. Am I on now? Um, yes. So then, does this um, ballot also have, uh, I guess I could read it, but I could ask you, um, does it have any kind of funding to help um, kind of make people who are resident non-citizens aware that they can vote and encourage them to vote as well as, it's, it will be, it sounds like it would be a little more work at the poll uh, to, to some people who will get all the ballots and some people will just get the local ballot. Yeah, so um, it, it ha would have to pass. So, if, so the charter change process really speaks to the amending the document that is essentially the constitution of the city of Burlington. So the way that that works is that we have to have a public vote. Should the public vote in the affirmative, a majority of voters say, see, signal that they are in favor of this charter change, then what happens is that it goes to Montpelier, where the legislature has to vote on it, um, and then the governor actually has to, to sign it uh, into sign that authority because the charter is essentially the authority granted to our municipality and giving us rights to do certain things as a city uh, in the context of the state of Vermont. And so we have to have essentially permission from them to do that. So there's this other step of that. So should that get through, um, then we would be able to, um, then we would take those next steps about sort of the logistics and how we get the word out, how we would manage it um, in terms of this. But Montpelier is moving forward with it. Uh, legislative Council at the state level um, wrote a long brief on how this is in fact constitutional. Um, so um, it is something that other communities have done and have been able to figure out. So I think we, should it pass and should the, the, the legislature and the governor sign it, we will be able to figure it out and get this in place hopefully for for um, next town meeting day. We do have the benefit then too of, of everyone running for office is going to tell everyone they meet that this is the case. Um, the number of houses in this ward that I knock on doors where people can't participate yet they have legal residency, legal, you know, they're basically they have a document that allows them to, allow them to is significant. It's pretty surprising how many people. Uh, and they often just say, I, you probably don't want to talk to me because I can't vote for you, but I would, I would or I can't vote, period. And, uh, so uh, we'll be educating folks in that manner as well as organizations in the community that can certainly help AALV and others to interact with folks. Melissa. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. What organizations um, did you work with before proposing this um, this amendment or whatever it's called? Did you work with AALV or did you ask folks like if they wanted to vote or talk to the new immigrant communities or folks? involved in that like who 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 specifically did you talk to um i know brian you you've knocked on doors and you've talked to people and you're you're close to specifically the nepali community but who who specific who do you, did you talk to did you talk to alb did you make those connections so this was brought by council roof um so i'm not sure who council roof has been working with on this um i have to, to follow back up with him on it uh, at the committee level yeah, that'd be the, the concern that we, we heard was around sort of persecution and wanting to make sure that we were opening folks up to that. And so 
we reached out to the ACLU and Migrant Justice on, on those issues. Um, but we can certainly circle back to uh, any other groups that you think would be valuable, certainly ALB, um, and anyone else be happy to reach out and just give them that. But I'm not sure who Council Roof chatted with prior to, to bringing this. And Migrant Justice response was that it could go, it could be expanded further. That was their stance, that it was, um, that they were very supportive and that they would um, support it even going further. That it, Because it seems like, I mean, ALB is right upstairs, like there's there's organizations that could be consulted um, who work specifically with um, immigrant populations to talk about to talk about the wording of this or or how it affects the actual folks who will be voting that I think really needs to or needed to be talked about. Um, but People needed to be, uh, a lot of people needed to be consulted maybe. Um, that's just a, a slight concern of mine that that, that could have been co um, consulted about what they want to do, those individuals want to do as um, voting. And I can certainly share that also with Council Roof and uh, ask it if you can do, do some of that as well. So the last item that we have, um, well, assuming, unless there's more on that particular issue, voting rights, expanding voter rights to others, uh, is the um, public safety increase to this public safety tax, and that is basically police and fire have a specific tax on this bill that is public safety, and the fire department um, essentially advocated uh, for another ambulance in the New North End. There is no ambulance. It takes fair amount of time for the ambulance from Station 2, which is on the corner of North Avenue and Strong Street, to reach the North End, um, and 80% of the calls to the fire department from that part of Burlington um, are ambulance related. So um, you don't, you can't just buy an ambulance and hope that there's people to staff it. You need to actually buy the ambulance and staff it. And so the, um, the staffing is included in this request, and that's why it's uh, coming before the voters. So it's, um, Three cents, Mr. Mayor. We'll probably speak to this later, but I think it's three cents for every hundred dollars of property value. Would be, uh, uh, the amount of tax. So there'll be more information about how that will impact the average or the median uh, value of home uh, in Burlington. But it's about take the numbers Melissa gave earlier, and since it's versus a penny, you just triple it. Yeah, exactly. So. Questions on that, or even anything that we didn't talk about? We're not only here to talk about ballot items, so. We have time for about three questions, like if anyone has questions. Hey guys, I asked you this last time, and I'm gonna ask you again. Um, so, uh, talking about the net zero of Burlington and the climate crisis resolution that you guys passed, What's on your mind for the next couple of months? What's on your to-do list here at Hatchet Item List? There are probably um, action items that are in the works at, at various levels right now, but um, the one that um, I've personally done some research on that um, Burlington Electric also has spent a fair amount of time looking at is how to close the gap for the property owner that has to make conversions and improvements to their building, whether it be weatherization or fuel switching um, to air source heat pumps uh, or install renewables. And the, the idea of, of tariff on bill financing, which is a technical way to use the utility bill to pay back uh, an expense that the utility itself incurs. They basically use their access to capital. They pay for the improvements and you repay the utility through your bill. Um, we don't have it in Vermont, it's not actually enabled, so it needs to get through um, uh, some, it needs to do some work at the state level, but um, that's, uh, so it's closing the financing gap to, to make that conversion to clean energy for property owners. Uh, another thing is that we saw on, on Monday, at Monday's council meeting, we had a resolution um, that came out of the Transportation Committee, which is one of the committees that I'm on, and um, we are really, what that, what that, 
uh, resolution asked for was really assessing the cost of providing the parking resources that we provide in the city of Burlington um, to really understand how, and to more broadly understand the cost uh, and really the degree to which we're uh, subsidized and driving uh, in the city of Burlington to really understand um, how much that costs us um, to provide those resources um, with an eye towards uh, hopefully once we understand what those costs are, thinking about uh, other ways that we can fund um, different modes of transportation, um, basically wanting to make sure that folks who are using different using those modes are paying their fair share because there's a huge difference between the amount of money, for instance, that we spend on car infrastructure and supporting cars versus walking, biking, and transit. Um, and so I think that that's an important conversation. So this, what this resolution will do is that it will get us that information back in March. Um, I, think, I see this as part of a much broader conversation about um, really needing to move forward um, on revolutionizing our transportation system. One specific thing Jake, that I think we'll, we'll be seeing in the next couple months is, and it's gonna, gonna really uh, come to uh, a head is the um, North Manuski Corridor Study. Um, which will, uh, which has looked at the entire length of the North Winooski um, corridor, so all the way from Community Health Center in our part of town, all the way down through the south end, uh, through downtown and into the south end. Um, we have the final meeting of that committee coming up at the end of this month on the 28th, uh, and then after that, it should be, it'll come to the Transportation Committee of the City Council for further review, um, and then with a vote uh, for the full City Council coming in February. What that plan is looking at doing is essentially uh, adding in additional bike and pedestrian resources along the corridor. Um, there's a current uh, alternative that um, would essentially put bike lanes in both directions um, throughout the entirety of the corridor, really getting us that um, bike facility um, throughout. So in the down, in the Old North End section, um, that means um, adding a bike lane, but removing parking in order to uh, have the bike lane go in both directions. In the downtown section, going from four to three lane, convert four lanes to three lanes, so center turn line with bike, turn lane with bike lanes on either side. And then you move into the south end, which already simply has those the two-way bike lanes going on. So there's a little bit less disruption there than what we already have going on. Um, but that's a really active conversation and something that we're gonna um, be discussing uh, at the committee level and the full council level in the coming months. And I think that we look back at things like Plan B TV Walk Bike. This was the vision that we set for um, revolutionizing or becoming a world-class city for walking and biking. North Winooski was really the crucial um, sort of um, keystone street for revolutionizing that system and for really creating that, that, uh, that added safety, that added benefit um, that allows us to really get more people riding and feeling comfortable riding and wanting to ride. Um, throughout our city. And so that's one of the big things I think from a climate perspective, because when we look at our climate goals, we continue to see year over year that vehicle miles travel go up. Um, when we need to be, we know that we need to be drawing those miles down. So I think this is a crucial conversation for us when it comes to these climate issues um, and in terms of having a network. I view it as we either have North Winooski um, as part of that, um, as part of that network, or we really don't have a network, I think. So I think it's crucial that we move forward with those conversations. Um, well, can I speak to the climate question as well? I, I mean, I appreciate the um, information and the, um, and the projects that you just mentioned. I, I just have a lot of concerns that we're sort of creating a lot of piecemeal um, solutions and moving at a snail's pace. Um, sorry, I'm, I'm really under the weather. I'm, sorry. I'm glad that I made it here tonight, but I'm definitely uh, probably going to have to leave after this. But I, I just have a lot of concern, and I think um, it's been hard for me as someone who came from labor organizing and climate organizing to move into this role and have so much um, that comes that is not related to climate. I mean, we discuss things that are not the climate, and for good reason. Um, there are a lot of issues that need to be addressed, but one of my um, thoughts when I ran was after attending so many public meetings and council meetings and MPAs is just how little we actually talk about this huge emergency that we are in and how um, sort of piecemeal we are moving and, and slowly we are moving to address the problem. And I think part of that, um, when I think about it, is this idea that I'm not sure that in our collective conscience we have really... Um, understood that we, we actually have to change everything truly and all of us 
need to change everything, and I think it means not just elected leaders and, and, and leaders in our community doing as much as they can to move this conversation along and put policy in place, but it means all of us really taking that on and not to push it on individuals because this is a collective change, um, but the level of um, movement and uh, movement building and, um, and um, action that needs to have is, is immense. And I, 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 really, I really want to um, implore that and, and just continue to have that sort of call to action in that way and to really, um, for all of us to wake up in the morning thinking about this and to think about it throughout our day and to go to bed thinking about it and think about the things that we do every day that are, um, that are just not sustainable. The way that we are living is not sustainable. Um, we, I don't know if people have been following, and of course, what's been going on in Australia, um, and the, it's, you know, we are living in a crisis, and so um, I'm interested in seeing um, change that is real change. I believe that we can't change without changing, um, and I'd like to see how um, my capacity can um, affect that as well, but um, I do have concerns that there's a lot of, um, that movement is slow um, right now, and that we need a lot more urgency. So I'm glad, I, you know, I really um, believe in the changes that need to happen to UCF and some of the other things that have been mentioned around transportation demand management and fare free transit and, um, you know, a heating district and um, reducing our emissions, but we need to reduce consumption, and I think that we need to really um, move quicker and be all of us um, getting our hands into this um, and thinking about it as a justice movement um, and thinking about how this is affecting also the labor movement and working people. Um, that's my that's my response. So I know we have more questions. Amanda, yours will be the last question for okay. this round. Um, I, to going back to I I feel like I'm, after what Perry said because this really important beautiful statement and I'm getting back to kind of seemingly insignificant details but um, um, one of the things I remember hearing someplace and I don't know if Kurt said it or somebody else was that something like 80 percent of the drivers and or parkers in Burlington are non-Burlington residents um, am I right about that or and if so how does this impact that or is there a percentage that we know about? I'm sorry, can you, can you repeat the question? So in terms of looking at the, the study um, that the City Council passed for um, looking at how much parking costs and, and then how we change that, um, and or how we adjust and use our resources in a different way. I think it's something like a huge percentage of the drivers and parkers in Burlington are not Burlington residents. And so it's, and I'm wondering how, how you were thinking about that for, for residents versus non-residents. I mean, I think it's definitely one of those things where we need to, to create some balance there. I think that one of the things is that I think we need to pay attention to that for sure. I think that one of the things that is frustrating to me is this a, a lot of short trips by people who really are, are able to, to walk and could walk and those kinds of things. So I think that that's really trying to, that's really one of the, the easier areas, but I think we definitely need to make, make sure we balance that need for you know the commuters as well as folks who are um, coming from further away. I think that they're one of the things that we had discussed in the past was sort of this notion of parking rides, and there have been uh, conversations. There's one that I remember having a while ago about creating sort of a slip lane off of 89 and working with the Sheridan um, to have some sort of parking garage and, and sort of intercept facility where people would basically who were coming from out of town would be able to be caught and then you basically bust them in. And that was a concept a while ago. I think there's some complexity to, to that, but there may be other solutions like that where we would be able to accommodate folks like that without having to, to, to really assess, to, to really um, uh, impact you know, the, the Burlington residents as well. But I think the reality is that we really need to, to kind of change everything uh, around, around that sort of car culture and that car centrism that we have. And really ask some of these questions. At least ask, you know, be, ask the questions, get the information, really open our eyes to, to the, the true costs of the things that we're doing. 
uh, and, and how much subsidy we're really putting into these things. Uh, thank you, uh, Amanda. I think what you're remembering is that 73% of all the people who are employed in Burlington do not live in Burlington. And most of them come here every day by themselves. Um, do any of our city councilors have any last things they would like to address before we wrap up and then maybe like two or three minutes? I just wanted to mention quickly that last night the Public Safety Committee met, uh, which I'm a member of uh, last night for the first time since um, March, so it was my first time as a counselor. Um, we discussed, and I have it here with me, um, the sheltering on public lands, outreach and removal policy and procedures. I don't know if anyone has been following this. There was a um, complaint a suit to the city around um, uh, uh, possessions that had been um, thrown out by um, city workers um, from someone who was um, sheltering on public lands um, and that the ACLU and the city has been in negotiations for a long time about what to do about if um, encampments people are being asked when what sort of all the regulations around posting when and the amount of time that people are going to be asked to leave and whether it's on um, lands that are where camping is prohibited or not prohibited um, so I could give you a lot longer, but I don't want to keep you um, too long, but there's been some sort of um, agreement around that, and then also the Church Street Marketplace Commission came to talk about some of their um, concerns around behaviors on Church Street, which I actually had a lot of concerns around the language that we're using around that. I think in September they passed um, a few things regarding like banning furniture and maybe sleeping, um, which they don't have the actual ultimate authority to do, and I think it would have to go through ordinance committee. Um, those are things that I have concerns about. I don't, that's not the direction that I think we should be going in um, as a city. Um, and I would like to talk about um, the appointment of Chief um, Jennifer Morrison, but I think that um, we're probably pretty low on time, so I can, but maybe next time. Just one thing that I want to announce for folks, I'm not going to get into the issue, but we do have a meeting coming up um, on the 16th um, at the River, at Riverside Apartments in the community room um, there over on Riverside Avenue to discuss the Amtrak uh, and where the Amtrak will be overnighted. Um, so if you're interested in learning more about um, Amtrak uh, coming to Burlington and what that might mean for the Old North End um, or just our city in general, um, I encourage you to attend. It's at 6 p.m. on uh, January 16th uh, in the community room uh, over in the, the Riverside Apartments. Thank you. Thank you to our city councilors, Max Tracy, Brian Bryant, Barry Freeman. Next up, we have Mayor Weinberger. Good evening, everybody. It is good to be back with you. And um, let tell the okay. It's not turned off. It's not. How's this? All right. There we go. Sorry. Um, it is good to be back with you, and um, I will try to uh, not be redundant with my remarks um, over what the city councilors just covered. Um, I, w I, I do want to just uh, um, continue. I'll start with the, the discussion that, that Perry was on about the work that the city is doing with respect to um, the climate emergency. Uh, and I think the scenario where, in, at some level, um, uh, I was happy to um, sign the climate emergency resolutions. I certainly fully agree with this sense of we are in a climate emergency and that we need to be doing an enormous about, amount about it. I, um, I think I have some different perspectives on how we're doing. I, uh, I both um, think that there is an optimistic vision out there that we can get to and that it's important to understand that if we're going to realize it. Um, and I think we should be proud of what Burlington has done um, over decades and what we are, are currently doing. And I guess a third kind of meta point, and I'll give some details, I, I certainly come from the perspective that this is a, a marathon, not a sprint. And uh, what I mean by that in part is 
what, what the direction we have committed ourselves to in 2019 was one of the, I think, big achievements of 2019 is we released the Net Zero Energy City Plan, which I still believe is the most ambitious local climate initiative um, of, of any in the country that a municipality or a kind of local region has put out. Um, and one of the things I find exciting about it is it, it kind of lays out a path right, to getting to a essentially decarbonized Burlington in a little more than a decade um, that uh, does require us to do some things differently. It does envision more biking and walking, and that's why um, those infrastructure projects and max reference, I'm very much supportive of them. Um, it does, I think, kind of related to that, require us to use our land in different ways, which is why we have these major initiatives going through the city council right now that would uh, densify Burlington, that would create more living opportunities in Burlington so that people are living here where there's good bike and walk infrastructure, where they can be in multifamily housing that don't consume anywhere near the amounts of energy that single family homes often the exurbs do. Um, uh, and and um, so we need to do a lot of that, and I, I, we are working on it. Um, how, what also though, what I find exciting about the BED plan is that it envisions a decarbonized Burlington where um, that feels very achievable to me. And it, it, it shows us converting over our cars. People will still own cars under this vision. They will just be electric cars instead of gas burning cars that are fully um, recharged with Burlington's 100% renewable energy, which we, you know, a, a threshold we got to in 2014. Instead of burning natural gas or oil or, or wood for the heating of our homes, um, people could be using ground source heat pumps that are, the, the energy involved in that is, is electrically generated or that's not so realistic on a residential scale always. So there are now these cold climate heat pumps, which are a technology that's getting better and better and more viable uh, in, in more and more scenarios. So um, to me, it's a very exciting thing to think that instead of some of these very uh, uh, almost apocalyptic scenarios out there that it's just so overwhelming and it's hard to understand how we could possibly do what we need to do. This is a roadmap that says we can get to the decarbonized future we need to and, and basically um, afford it. There, there's not some uh, incredible austerity that's needed and there's not some incredible um, expense that's needed. So I think that's exciting. We're going to keep working towards it. We've got a bunch of things coming to the city council in the months ahead. So we'll get answered. Ask, well, I'll give you a further update next time we're back about uh, the homework assignment there. But let me hit some other timely issues. Um, I'm not going to hit all the, the uh, bottled items unless you have questions about it. But the housing trust fund, I, I want to make sure, I appreciate Melissa's question about the numbers. Let me make sure that, although the numbers I think are, are, are modest um, for most property owners, um, the cumulative impact of those numbers is significant. We will go from having a couple hundred thousand dollars a year locally generated for affordable housing initiatives to over the next couple years that figure will rise to more than 500,000. So it is a more than doubling of the local resources that are dedicated um, for addressing um, <coughs> our most acute housing challenges. And this is money that I think will allow us to do more with respect to fighting homelessness problems. Um, it will uh, allow us to be very nimble when opportunities come up, like uh, there was a couple years ago, people may remember, there was a moment that looked like the Farrington Mobile Home Park was going to be sold to the private market and there was a real risk to the people living there. The city was able to use this housing trust fund and help them move quickly to uh, what they have today, which is a, a resident uh, co-op um, where the residents control the future of, of that community. We wouldn't, the, the, the housing trust fund, it was mostly the residents who got that done. The housing trust fund played a key role. Though. This would give us more of that type of flexibility. And I fully support it and uh, we'll be out there campaigning for it. Um, just, I think there's a little bit of reference to the public safety, possible increase in the public safety tax. I just want to make sure it's clear what that's about. Um, we have two ambulances today that serve the entire city. We've had that for about 20 years. Before that, there was just one ambulance. We're at the point now where those two ambulances are basically as busy as one ambulance was 20 years ago. The number of calls for a variety of reasons, some population growth, aging of the population, changes in the way people 
Um, just changes the way people use the system. We um, are, are get busier and busier every year. Every year the calls go up. We're basically at the point now where if the city is going to continue the um, very responsive, um, high quality ambulance services that we provide today, we're going to have to add a third, third ambulance. And that's what this vote will be about. The exact financial impact where we are still, Brian is right with number you reference now, it's still just a, it's a, it's a proposal now, by the end of the month, the city council with the administration will be finalizing that, and then that will go on the ballot. So um, next month we'll be able to speak more specifically about that. Um, <coughs> the, um, you know, I'm gonna try to be quick here so that if there is some time for question and answers, I know there's been a lot going on with the police department of late, so to put it mildly, I'm happy to answer questions about that. I do want to make sure everyone knows that we have started the effort to find a new permanent police chief. I think we're very fortunate to have a interim police chief, a woman who worked with, was part of the BPD for 23 years, rose to become Burlington's uh, first female deputy chief back in 2013. She left us for five years to be the chief of the Colchester Police Department, and then she retired. She's come out of retirement um, quite remarkably kind of responding to the need and the call uh, that, that, that we had here and um, is serving for four to six months. Her name is Jennifer Morrison, if uh, you didn't see that, I haven't had it. Um, she will not, she's made it really clear, she doesn't intend to apply for the permanent chief's position, so we're gonna be searching for a new permanent chief. We have started that process. I gave a memo to the city council this week that laid out the process we envision. It's quite similar to the one that we followed back in 2015. Um, the first step of that is now. We will, with the police commission, be having a public meeting soliciting input from, from everybody about what qualities and characters, skills, what you're hoping to see in the next Burlington Chief of Police. Um, and then we'll go from there, uh, and this will be as community-engaged processes as we can. Like the last time where more than 50 members of the community were really to look directly, significantly involved in the selection of the police chief. We're going to try to replicate something like that. We think it's going to take probably four to six months, so it'll be an extended process. Um, I want to talk a little bit about accessory dwelling units. Kind of a wonky, dry term, but this is a really important issue, and it's one that is in front of the city council right now. We have a work session Monday on it, and this is um, this issue that, again, I think this is important for the climate emergency. This is like how do we uh, create more homes for people living in walkable, bikeable Burlington versus out in the suburbs. It's also, you know, sometimes we've had debates here, you know, uh, back and forth about whether the city is doing enough to support renters. And I see this issue as very much a renter issue. And it's being seen that way around the country and other parts of the state. There have been renters' rights uh, renter protection movements that have gotten behind um, California. And then let, let me explain what I mean about it, make sure we're all understanding this. Is, again, it's a little bit technical. ADUs are accessory dwelling units. These are second homes that are built and on the lot of a single family home. So usually it's done as a, sometimes it happens as a basement home or some, uh, 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 an addition to the main house off the back of a house or perhaps, you know, people call them grading flats, right? Like these uh, little apartments above a garage or a little cottage in the backyard. Um, these, these, these have been talked about for a long time as an affordable housing solution because they're a way to create, in a city like Burlington, potentially thousands of additional homes helping us address our housing supply challenge. They, and thousands of affordable homes. These tend to be smaller units that, um, that rent at prices that even without sort of subsidy or regulation are on the more affordable end. The state actually passed a law back in the 1990s saying this had to be legal throughout the, the state. Um, unfortunately, even though it is technically legal in our ordinance, very, very few of these have been built, just a handful. And the reason comes down to our, our rules that even though technically these um, units are legal. There are parking requirements and lot coverage requirements and sprinkler requirements and home ownership requirements that 
together are a bunch of barriers that can get in the way of these being built. Um, we are trying to eliminate the barriers that we can there, and we've got a pretty uh, significant um, reform that is in front of the council, it came out of the housing summits this, this uh, summer. And one of the barriers that I think should be removed, it's not currently been removed in the draft that's before the council, but I think that it should be removed is the home ownership requirement. Um, why do I say that removing that would be pro renter? Well, for one, like literally what this says is, if you are a renter, it is illegal for you to live in this, this home under certain scenarios. It's hard to imagine something that's sort of more directly anti-renter than that. It's also anti-renter in the sense that because this is a barrier that keeps these from being built in the first place, there are just far less of these opportunities for renters than there would be in, if we got our regulations right. So if we're going to have a debate about this, if, if this makes sense to you, if you care about this, the council needs to hear from you. I think it's really un unclear which way this is going. Um, and there will be a vote on that either the 21st or probably the 27th of this month. So, uh, well, uh, I think that we should should take some questions. Take some questions. Okay. We have maybe time for maybe two or three questions if anyone has questions. Yeah. Maybe two if they're long. Are you planning on doing anything about the sidewalks on North Champlain Street? <coughs> so, um, both sides are impassable okay. in the winter. Are impassable in the winter because the way that because of how what bad shape they're in, or because of what because the way in which they're they're maintaining their plow. Um, what bad shape they're in, and in the way they're plowed. Okay. Um, there are certain areas that dip, yeah. that melt and turn into solid ice. Yeah. So we're climbing around them through the snow banks. I mean, there are areas of the city with decent sidewalks. The, North, the, North, the old North End does not have them. I agree there are areas in the city, there, there are streets in the city that have decent sidewalks. Um, there are, unfortunately, way too many areas throughout the city that don't. I will look in, Barbara, to this, specifically what's going on in North Champlain and um, uh, see, if, see where that is in the kind of prioritization system. Um, hopefully people are aware that for three years in a row now, we've just completed our third year of building, uh, replacing about 300% the amount of sidewalks than we um, have on a historic basis. The sustainable infrastructure bond that you know, the city supported, more than 70% of the city supported back in 2016 has allowed now uh, us to change the trajectory of our sidewalk maintenance, which was headed the wrong way. For, for a long time, we'd only been replacing about one mile of sidewalk a year. We have a, something like 129 miles of sidewalk. Sidewalks don't last 129 years. You need to be on a much more frequent cycle than that, and that's what the Sustainable Infrastructure Bond has allowed us to do. Um, we've worked pretty closely with, this is an issue that Council Tracy and I have worked closely on, and, and we're committed to, to continuing that high, that much higher than kind of the past level of, of funding, but we got to deep hole to dig out here, and I'm not in any way questioning. I don't know exactly the condition you're talking about, but I hope, I, 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 I know we've done a lot of work in the Old North End, we try to be quite deliberate about, about and it's kind of, it's a not a political process by which the sidewalks get chosen, there is an empirical rating system, there are sort of computer measurements uh, done, as well as sort of use analysis to try to make sure, since we are in such a deficit, that we put the money in where it will have its greatest impact, we got much more work to do here, I acknowledge that. I, I guess I'm just saying that if walking is a priority, sidewalks need to be fixed faster. Can we have a question back here? It's one that's just one more thing just about the sidewalks that people should know. Since we can't replace all the sidewalk, as much, since it is a huge financial impediment, to do as much replacement as we need to. Another thing that has started in recent years, and maybe you'll notice it if you weren't already aware of it, we use a diamond blade now to uh, slice down rock sidewalks and level them out as much as we can if we're not in a position to replace it yet. And sometimes that 
um, addresses lips that develop and other unevenness. So we're trying to hit this in a couple of directions. Amanda? Um, and I don't know if Perry, well, I don't know if the city councilors or you are better, better to answer this question, but maybe everybody can. So I was just wondering about the um, public safety tax and another ambulance, which, um, which I just want more information. Um, so we have two for the Burlington Fire Department, but then how does that interact with like uh, union rescues, um, ambulances and the medical centers, ambulances and, and, and private ambulances? And then I'm also wondering, it seems like, so that's three times the amount of the affordable housing. And I'm wondering what else, is it ambulance and full time staff? How is, how are, it seems, uh, is it, does insurance get billed? Does UVM, um, I mean, does, um, does Burlington Fire Department bill for their ambulance services and why is it so expensive? Yeah, great questions, Amanda. So, um, so yes, if you call 911, if you call for an emergency, you know, an ambulance in Burlington, the, the city fire department tries to respond to 100% of those calls. Um, that is, um, that's essentially the goal, the standard. It's the way we can best ensure um, rapid and high quality care. Um, when the two ambulances are busy, um, then we do have these mutual aid agreements that result in um, usually the UVM ambulance is the next ambulance that responds, but they have it, and that is a uh, um, st staffed by students who are you know, really quite committed students. Um, they serve an area that's broader than just Burlington, though, so sometimes they're busy as well, in which case sometimes ambulances end up coming from some distance, from Colchester or South Burlington um, or elsewhere. Uh, the, um, the concern is that if you're relying, and we, basically that happens at least once a day right now, that it's some kind of mutual aid call. Um, there is a concern that if we become overly reliant on mutual aid, that we, um, at times will not be able to provide the, the, the you know, the wait times will go up dramatically. Um, even if they aren't going up dramatically on average, if you have, you know, occasionally one that just takes an exceedingly long time, that can be a matter of life or death for, for so that is really what the rationalization comes down to. Why is it so expensive? It's not totally intuitive either. You know, the reason it's so expensive is because it's not about the, physically the ambulance, we actually already have a 30 ambulance, it's sort of a spare ambulance that sits out. So that's not the expense involved here. It's, um, it's the fact that we have, we will basically need three shifts of the ambulance workers um, that, um, so that's, we have three different shifts, two people staff each ambulance, so that's six uh, new firefighter EMTs that we need to be hired. One thing we've learned the hard way is that if you, you need to actually hire more than that because you, when any, you can't, you know, if you're in a situation where you have to bring in someone else on overtime every time someone goes on vacation or has a baby, you, you just sends, uh, sends overtime costs through the roof and you burn out staff. So essentially we, the, the expense of this proposal is hiring nine new firefighters. It is a more than 10% increase in the total size of the department. Um, and it's expensive, and the expenses way outpace the limited reimbursements that we get for, there are some fees that are paid, but they're limited, that the costs are much higher. And we'll, we'll have that all broken out, you know, I, I don't have, as we get a little closer, we'll, um, we'll put out more detail on that sheet. Gotcha. This will be the last question. I'm going to speak for myself, when you come here, you talk about affordable housing, you get into the weeds and my eyes glaze over. Um, as, a, as you said earlier, homework assignment. If you came to us with like, hey, we have a great program, it's a volunteer program, we're gonna give tax incentive for landlords to keep affordable housing. Um, we're gonna give them, you know, big accolades. You can come up with, hey, I'm working with the UVM to uh, take some of their endowment and refocus it on neighborhoods that are super saturated. Really simple programs. Um, you, 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 you are passionate, and I do hear you, and I do believe you, but I don't think, I'm a homeowner, so I have a, you know, a different opinion, but most of the people I know who are renters, they don't see that you are as passionate about it because the market is super tight, and the rent is too damn high, still. 
So if you could give us some more tangible, rather than getting in the weeds, yeah. um, and it's, rent control is super complicated. That may happen, but it's like 20 years from now. How about, like, there was a ton of really great ideas. Tiny houses are one of them. It's a royal pain in the neck to hook up a tiny house in Burlington, still. Um, it's a total visit. I mean, you could do that, but there's millions of other little tiny projects that you could be like, done, we nailed it, we nailed it, we nailed it. I just feel like you're giving them these, these massive, totally heady, you know, political techno walk stuff, and you're not, you're missing all the little granular details that would actually, you know, if not contribute to keeping affordable housing, you know, affordable, but it would actually increase the affordable housing in the market. I appreciate the feedback, uh, Patrick, and uh, I, I'm sure you're right. I get, you know, I have spent 20 years working, pretty much my whole professional career has been working in housing. I, I'd like to think, although it's called, the, what we're talking about here is pretty close to your tiny home. We're basically saying, can we remove the bar barriers that keep these small, tiny cottages or little apartments or garages from being built? Um, this is an ordinance that would do it. Um, and I think people hear from you that this is something you want done, it's got a good chance of passage, but it's hanging. There's some political, uh, the unpopular elements to it as well. So, um, I, I, but I, I hear your point, and when I, in my future, uh, future housing talks, I'll try to, try to keep it as direct as I can. All right, thank you so much, Mayor. Next up, we have our House Representative. Kurt McCormick, Jill Krausinski, Celine Colbert, and Brian Chena. Hello, good evening. Just making sure we're coordinated up here. Good evening, everyone. We're excited to be here. We're in the first week of the legislative session. I'm Representative Jill Krominski, and uh, Kurt and I represent uh, Old North End in downtown. Uh, we were thinking today that it might be helpful to give you our reactions to the Governor's State of the State Address that happened this afternoon. Uh, so I'm trying to remain a positive person despite what's happening in this country right now. So I'm going to start off with what I thought was positive, <laughs> and I will give you my response to my concerns um, about what was not in his speech or did he did not talk enough about. So first of all, one thing that the governor spoke about today and both House Speaker Mitzi Johnson and Senate President uh, Pro Tem Tim Ash talked about is the importance of us being models in civility uh, because of the rhetoric that's happening in Washington right now. Uh, we are starting to see some of that seep into some of the dialogue um, in communities and at the state house, and that's not okay. So we want to make sure that we are setting a good example um, by not name calling, by not using, not calling people brats, but <laughs> really um, being role models. So I think that is a good thing that everyone is agreeing that we want um, to to really set um, a good model moving forward. One of the things the governor mentioned in his speech today is the importance and what he will put in his budget around um, after school programs or expanded learning opportunities, uh, which is something that I think we all agree on. We did really great work last session increasing and investing um, in affordable childcare and workforce development. And we haven't seen exactly how much and what he's thinking of in terms of scope, but I think we all can agree that having options for kids after school and during the summer and fall when they're not in school is one of the best preventative and supportive measures that we can do for our kids. So I think that is a great investment and I look forward to seeing what the governor um, is gonna put forward in his budget around that. Um, some of the takeaways, um, sitting from where I was on the floor listening to the governor today, is that he was very, very short on climate action. And I know you'll hear more about this from, from my colleagues, but. Uh, all he really talked about is how we can do more when it comes to electronic vehicles and how great it is that we see some new EVs like 150s and Ford Mustangs and Harley Davidsons, but the reality is they all use more money and we're not going to solve this problem with electric vehicles. It's going to take a lot more than that. And I'm excited about the work 
that we're planning around a climate energy or a climate um, prevention, climate action package. I've heard it so many different ways. But I think that we are, we have a really good uh, package of bills that we all support and are working on to get across the finish line and to, to the governor's desk. And I think what we heard from him today in that speech is that he's not going to be interested in backing a lot of the work that we're doing. So um, I'm flagging that as a big problem and something that we're going to have a lot of work to do around. He also talked about how he wants to make Vermont more affordable for families. But yet I didn't hear any concrete for proposals or work that we've been doing that really does that. So raising the minimum wage would be one. Um, creating a statewide paid family and medical leave insurance program. He uh, made a contract with the Vermont State Employees Association uh, that created a, a deal that state employees would get access to a paid family leave program and then everyone else in the state could buy in. So what's interesting right now for everyone to know is that if we don't pass a paid family leave program or we pass it and he vetoes it and we don't override it, that plan goes into place. So state employees have access to a program and people have, it's voluntary to go in. I think that's a, a bad way to approach this and it should be available to everyone. And I think it makes the, the program stronger if everyone is in. If we do pass it, um, then the state employees will get, um, what, we'll all get the same package and a more generous package um, and then the state employees will get a bonus on top of that. So it was really interesting to see um, this new dynamic at play. So there will be some sort of, but there's at this point, no, some plan in place. Um, I think we all have opinions about which one's better than the other. Um, but I really think ours um, is important to have everyone in and to have more weeks for people, including medical. And then the last thing I'll say is that there was no point in his speech that he talked about or reflected on the problems happening in our Department of Corrections and what happened at the women's prison in South Burlington. Uh, that deeply concerns me because that is a problem and we cannot tolerate what's happening there. And to hear him not mention that at all, I, I just think it's a problem and it's a priority for us. Thank you, Jill. Um, so the governor speaks today uh, when it came to transportation, he acknowledged clearly, if not that team was a little high, he said that uh, half of our CO2 emissions now are from transportation, it's actually uh, 40, 45%. So, but that was a, a good exaggeration. And it's going to be true soon because uh, just a year or two ago it was 43%, so it's climbing, not descending. And, um, uh, you've all heard of the TCI, Transportation Climate Initiative. He did not express support for that, even though members of his administration have been working on it, as have the, um, as the legislature, uh, mainly in the form of the um, Climate Solutions uh, Caucus. So, I'm going to mention a few things, and I think you've heard me say these things before, but he, these are things that he didn't even mention. Jill was right. When it came to Climate and transportation. He talked about the electrification of Harley Davidson's, um, with the Corvette Stingray, I don't know. Mustang. Mustang. Oh, Mustang. That was it, yep. And I think they're a lot bigger than they were when I was young. Uh, and then something else, a big pickup truck system. So um, uh, I'm the chair of the Transportation Committee, really, for the following reasons. To move more resources and do more for transit, bicycle pedestrian, and rail. That, you can ask the speaker, why did she make me chair? And that's more or less the reason. Uh, and so that's what I try to do every day in my committee. Uh, and it's, it just became a lot more difficult with the government's speech. Because it's very hard, we're gonna, we're gonna try and we're gonna do it in most of these areas, but it's a, it's a lot easier when the governor recommends them, and maybe we advance them, maybe we increase them, but when he recommends nothing, no uh, expansion of transit, for instance, then we have to do it that's a little more difficult, and, and therefore somewhat uh, less likely. Um, we, last year, we had the uh, administration do these studies, and I know um, Brian, on Brian's first bill, it was on the committee that I used to be on, uh, artificial intelligence 
he had to settle for a study that year. I remember telling him that's that's how things move here. Oh, I'll tell you It was a task force. <laughs> Who recommended a commission? <laughs> well, anyway, this, this is now advancing and taking the next steps. Um, now, thanks to that, you have to take that first step. So, we had them do a transit ridership expansion study. How do we expand transit ridership? Transit, as you know, means mainly buses and, and light rail. When we say rail, we usually mean Amtrak uh, passenger. So the study is good, and it makes a number of good recommendations. And I don't know if we're going to see them recommended by the governor yet or not. Those recommendations are uh, education, trying to remove the stigma of young people in transit. Uh, I've heard recently just a, a horrible name for the for the North Avenue bus because it goes to the high school. Uh, and this is true around the country, and it's, it's got to stop. It's got to be considered cool to get on the bus, not what, uh, how it's considered now. And then we need to more uh, uh, elect uh, not electrify, but electronify it, uh, so that people know where buses are, know if they're late, if they're waiting for a bus to be dismissed, things like that. And then the two bigger ones, these are recommendations in the governor's study. We told them to do the study, they selected the consultants and oversaw the contract with that consultant, and these are the results of that study. Um, expand service, and seriously expand it, and you know, that takes money. You know, you know, get it today, there'll be no more money. Um, and fare free, which we talked about before. So a little bit on fare free, um, it actually works even better in urban areas. And when I say urban, I mean Burlington and kind of the inner Chittenden County. And um, uh, fare free actually gets more riderships, and it gets more riders, not really, but it gets even more, like 40% more, in a place like Burlington. However, the study indicates that um, in other places that have gone fare free, you may have heard of Kansas City, Missouri, this one fare free on the entire transit system. That's Kansas City. Uh, and we'll see how that goes. It hasn't even started yet. Um, but um, one problem, it's not a problem, but of that 40%, it's not all new riders. It's not all people that used to be in a car, now they're on the bus. Unfortunately, that includes people who just ride the bus more because now it's free. Yeah. Um, but knows you, you take the bus sometimes, sometimes you walk, sometimes you ride the bicycle. Oh, now it's free? I'll take the bus every time. So there's that, and then there's some people that uh, apparently who um, make trips they would not have made at all. So instead of staying home, they just went somewhere on the bus because it's free. Some people just really like, people like me, we love things that are free. And you just do it even if you otherwise wouldn't. Uh, so, um, I wanted to mention um, one more thing. Uh, 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 it's not about the governor's speech, although he certainly didn't mention this. And it was touched on by a couple of people tonight, including Patrick. Um, I signed on a bill, I signed the bill, a draft that has not been introduced yet, it might be tomorrow, to authorize any city or town in the state to have rent control. Now I know. Some housing, some affordable housing um, advocates have problems with rent control. I think it's all how it's done, and I'm trying to make it as local as possible. That is, create the authority for a town, a city like Burlington to do it, and then the city of Burlington to decide what the cap would be. Okay, thank you. Are you looking for co-sponsors for your bill, or did you hand it in already? Uh, so this is what happens, they hand them in, and people are like, why don't you support rent control? It's okay. It's okay, I'll, I'll get over it. It's on the record, he didn't ask me. Alright, so... So... I'm just gonna I was doing some research to make sure, I was fact-checking before I speak. Um, Alright, so... Um, when the governor gives his speech, I've learned that it's best if I take notes to like process my emotions and express myself in a healthy way. And usually it's more than one page. And then look at it. This is all we've got this time. So it, was, it wasn't as bad as in the past, I will say that. Um, so, yeah, the speech. The speech was pretty minimal. 
Yeah. So, did everyone hear his speech was interrupted by climate protesters? Yeah. Yeah. So there's a Digger article you should check out. Um, what I will say is that um, the, I thought the governor handled it well. He, he sat there and waited, and the sign language interpreter was interpreting the protesters for people, which was kind of cool. And, um, and then, but then they started repeating themselves, and then that's when people were like, okay, we heard this already, like, gotta move on. Um, what's unfortunate is that after the, both the governor and the speaker have asked us to be more civil, that there were certain members and former members um, teasing the protesters as they were dragged out of the room. Um, so you might want to check out the video on the Digger article, um, which it was disappointing. Um, and also telling, especially people who accuse others of being bullies. And then you watch, now we've got them on video showing you what we deal with all the time when there aren't cameras. But um, that being said, I'm going to be positive. I'm going to, um, what I do is I write down quotes of these things the governor says, and then I go meet with his liaison, and I say, remember when he said this? I have an idea about how we could do that. And so I, will, I plan to do that again, so I'll share with you what those things are. So he said we need sustainable economic growth and policy that's truly equitable. So, um, yes, it sounds really good. Well, um, I speak to the fire. So, so, um, so, and he also said, we need to, we can be protecting the environment. No, he said, protecting the environment can be done in ways that strengthen our economy. So I plan to, to meet with um, his legislative liaison and talk with her about the regenerative economy bill, which I spoke with you all about last time at length. So I'm not gonna give you the full explanation again, but when we talk about having, um, he talked, expressed concerns about uneven economic growth around the state and about how some counties have more economic activity than others and that some counties, the, the real estate's more valuable than others. Um, so I think one way to solve that is to have regional people's assemblies where people in regions identify the strengths and challenges of their counties and then create plans to, to hand the state so the state can make a road back where we look at how do we integrate our economy in a way that is, is, is equitable and is that making sure that every region is flourishing. Um, and so that's a way I think we could do it that would both um, create economic equity and social equity because not only are we looking at how we distribute resources, but also we're engaging people on the ground level all over the state in the decisions that affect their lives. Um, so I'm curious what he'll say to that. Um, so, and then one other thing I'll say because I want to make sure there's time for Representative Colburn is uh, he talked about Iceland and he talked about how successful Iceland has been it, which I was loving. Um, does anyone know how socialist Iceland is? So, 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 how Iceland is this model, and how in Iceland, you know, with the Iceland model, how they were able to turn the tide on this on substance use. That, that and I did some fact checking that youth in Iceland had one of the highest rates of substance abuse problems in the world. And by implementing this new model, they were able to totally turn that around. And so, what is the model? Well, what it is, there's different pieces, and the main piece of it is giving kids things to do that are healthy. Like, lots of things to do that are healthy. There's other pieces. So he's proposing a universal after-school program, which is great. It would be great if every child and youth in the state had access to some kind of after-school program and that you didn't have to pay for it so families in need could, could access it and, fam and wealthy families could access it or they could get their kids fancy ski programs or whatever, whatever wealthy families do. I don't know, but... Um, I don't know, so someone could, could, could share that. But the point is that it would be great if every child in the state could have access to high quality after school care. But is that really the only reason Iceland is doing so well? So I'm gonna ask because as far as I know, and I checked, Iceland has universal health care. Maybe that's part of the equation. Um, and Iceland locked up all their bankers and took over the banking system and, com and completely like changed their, their, their economic system over the last 11 years, which happens to coincide with when all this smart policy around children and after school programs happened. So I actually think I, what's going in in Iceland is a lot more complicated than universal after school. But I'm glad the governor's looking to Iceland as a model. And I, and I, would, and I support that. And I, I, would, I, would, I would urge all Vermonters to advocate that the state of Vermont look at Iceland as a model for, for how we should move forward 
in addressing climate change, in addressing social problems, and in addressing economic problems. Um, and we should also look at Norway when we're looking at reforming our correction system. So uh, I'm going to hand the mic over to Selena at that point. But those are just some of the thoughts I had with his speech, and I plan to talk with his liaison, maybe a little less sassy um, and jokey, but, but, but I will share some of those ideas. So um, I'll talk a little bit about, I think we're probably at or over time now, but the um, you heard, I think, from all of us concern about the governor's lack of a vision or agenda around climate. And it was so striking to have, you know, a half the galley filled with young people who are like clearly desperately concerned and worried for their future telling us, business as usual is unacceptable and then to have the speech resume and have the most business as usual climate platform put in front of us it was just unbelievable and so um what i heard in that platform was a lot of enthusiasm for the modest investments that we made last year in electric vehicles and charging stations um that I supported and are significant, but are nowhere near meeting the scale of what's been projected in terms of the number of vehicles we need to put on the road to meet our emissions targets. I heard a lot of enthusiasm for marketplace solutions in terms of like cool status cars that can now be electrified, so I guess maybe that's part of the solution. Um, I did hear support for efficiency Vermont's transition to an all what we're calling an all fuels efficiency model, so that was one positive thing that I heard. But we also I also heard very clearly that the governor said he's not gonna support regulation or accountability measures. I read that as a reference to our Global Warming Solutions Act that will hold the state accountable and get us back on track with our goals. And I heard him say that he would not support any initiative that costs money, essentially, that would raise any cost for Vermonters. So I think that was a message about what some of us have been looking at in the Transportation Climate Initiative, which would be a regional cap and invest schema. And um, I know there's concerns, you know, from on the right and the left of the political spectrum about whether that would be too regressive an approach um, if fuel suppliers had to had higher costs that then they passed on to consumers. But I think any carbon pricing scheme is all in the details of how you you construct it. And as a progressive, any carbon, I support carbon pricing schemes that are progressively structured that can be used essentially to redistribute wealth to our low income, moderate income, and rural Vermonters to fund a just transition. And so we heard the governor talking a lot about affordability and concern about Vermonters, um, you know, who would be uh, that he was concerned about in, in terms of the climate crisis, but we actually, but then he's turning his back on an opportunity to actually get resources in the hands of the Vermonters who are most disproportionately impacted by the climate crisis. And that's a huge mistake. I think the most regressive thing we can do, and the thing that will most disproportionately impact um, low income Vermonters, moderate income Vermonters, and rural income Vermonters is inaction. And the plan I heard from the governor today on climate was inaction, and that is unacceptable to me. I'm gonna fight it. Um, I I just want to say one more thing about his speech. There's lots of things I feel like I can say, but he talked a lot about regional disparities in the state. Um, he talked actually a lot about Chittenden County and how good we have it, and then um, how how difficult things are um, in rural parts of the state where there's demographic shifts, there's job loss, and, and I don't mean to, um, I don't mean to minimize the challenges that rural communities are facing, but I think we need to shift that narrative. That's the second, second or third time in the state of the state address that I've heard that narrative from him, and we need to move away from thinking about geographic disparities to thinking about economic disparities in the state. We have poverty in Chittenden County, and you don't need me to tell you that. We have an unacceptable poverty rate in Burlington. We have an unacceptable poverty rate in um, wards two and three in Burlington and all across the city. And so, you know, we need to be looking at 
not just a modest increase to our minimum wage, but getting the state to a truly livable wage as soon as humanly possible. In my opinion, we need to, need to be looking at a paid family leave program that is comprehensive and universal. And, and those are the things that will help Vermonters thrive in all corners of our state and that will help attract new Vermonters to our state. So I think we need to shift the narrative as progressives, as Democrats, um, away from this kind of pitting us against one another in terms of our regional differences and really talk about economic justice. Do we have any questions? We can maybe take two or three questions and I just ask that you keep your question concise um, so that we can get in as many as possible and still get out of here at a reasonable hour. Uh, thank you all for such great job. I really appreciate it. Um, I just want to thank uh, you, Selena, for your leadership on the, the sector for decriminalization bill. I was really excited to see that uh, when I woke up and read BT Digger the other day. And I'm just wondering if you can talk a little bit about what you're working on with that. Sure. The governor didn't mention that in his speech today. Um, but we had an amazing hearing, actually, in my committee on that yesterday. My committee chair is really supportive of this conversation. There's two bills in play. So I have introduced a bill um, along with uh, some other colleagues that would fully decriminalize sex work in the state of Vermont. So how that works is it just repeals our, what it has historically been called our prostitution um, chapter of, of criminal code and then it leaves all of our sex trafficking laws intact. So that covers anyone who has a minor is, um, you know, being pushed into performing sex work, and anyone who's coerced for any reason into sex work. We have, we have really strong trafficking laws in the state, and part of this effort is about clearly delineating between adult consensual sex work that many of us believe should not be criminalized and coerced forced sex trafficking. And I can tell you that even in my committee, I've heard real confusion from law enforcement about the difference between those things and who they should be holding accountable in those situations. So I've heard law enforcement come in and say, boy, we hope um, you know Sarah George will let us charge prostitution so that when women are being forced to trade drugs for sex, we can get them out of the situation by slapping them with criminal charges. Well, that's sex trafficking. That meets the definition of sex trafficking in our state. And the person who should be, um, you know, the person who should be subject to criminal charges in that situation is not the person who's being coerced into training sex work for drugs. So, we, there's a second bill, and I think that's the bill that's probably more on the track to passage this session um, that mirrors what they did in California, and it actually goes quite a bit further. So it's essentially mirrors our, um, what's sometimes called the Good Samaritan Law that we passed in Vermont around overdoses, and it says that if you are the victim of a crime, any crime, um, you can report it and seek assistance from law enforcement and you cannot be charged with prostitution, as we call it, in Vermont law. And you also cannot be charged with um, drug possession at the misdemeanor and lower felony levels. And we're looking at adding some other provisions. So it's a pretty, pretty broad immunity to protect um, some people in really vulnerable situations. And then that bill also has a full um, study that would look more closely at the question of well, it says modernizing Vermont's prostitution laws, but would hopefully look much more closely at the question of decriminalization. There's a lot of conceptual support from it, but people really want to hear from sex workers here in Vermont about what would be more, most useful and how to move forward. And one of the benefits of introducing this bill has been that I have started to hear from a lot of sex workers in Vermont and nationally, and so, um, if you, if you or anyone you know has experiences to share, I would really invite you to be in touch with me or put people in touch with me as we think about how to move this forward. So I think probably what we'll see this year is a commitment to further study and conversation and then 
um, some pretty broad immunity for people, but appreciate the support and the question on that. And I'm going to keep fighting for it. Any other questions? One here and then Kevin. Um, thank you for bringing up the, the Transportation and Climate Initiative. I was curious about that. Um, do you see any hope of that moving forward um, as long as, as Phil Scott is governor? And if it did, if we did sign on to the TCI, uh, what would we, would we possibly get some funding to improve transit for rural Vermonters, for example? If we signed on to the I'll say answer really quickly and then he can get handed over to Kurt if he wants to say more. If we signed on to TCI, we would not possibly, but definitely get um, funding for transit to improve transit. For, I mean, that, that's what like the TCI funds have a pretty clear criteria and it's around um, reinvesting in transportation initiatives and, in, and infrastructure and all kinds of incentives. So we would definitely get money back. I think there's questions about how much the legislature can move forward um, without the governor. I don't know how much you all have been looking at that. Jill, the, gov the executive branch really started and organized the conversation on TCI. Um, we do, I know Senator Ash drafted a bill on TCI participation and maybe there's one in your committee as well, but we'll answer that. Yes, thanks. Um, so the TCI, Transportation and Climate Initiative, is modeled very closely after the region, Regional Greenhouse Gas Initiative, which, uh, believe it or not, was uh, put into place by Governor Jimmy Douglas. And that's just on electricity. And very briefly, the high points of how it works is it's regional, which is really great. You don't have that problem with different prices of the fuel at the border and the Vermonters buying gas or something like that across the border. Um, and so regional is much better. Plus the impact is much greater. We're talking about um, in TCI, uh, 13 states including DC. And yeah, and that's one of those states is New York, one is Pennsylvania, New Jersey, six states. So um, Reggie, the first one, uh, has been extremely successful. We all pay a little more on our electricity bills. It's really small. That's why you probably never heard of this before. You never noticed it. And we get a lot. As a matter of fact, in both Reggie and possibly in TCI, we would be what you might call recipient states versus a donor state. That is, what we, if, if they pass the entire cost to us, so it did wind up at the pumps, um, to give you an idea, they're looking at three different scenarios and it goes up. So the smallest scenario, um, which would reduce uh, greenhouse gas emissions by 20%. That's, that's the lowest one. If we did that one and all the cost of the, of the program that we're hitting, not consumers, but the vendors of um, fossil fuels at the wholesale level, it's only 22 to 24 entities. So it's, it's not even Vermont companies. It's not, it's not the oil companies that deliver oil. It's not, uh, it would be Vermont natural gas, but it's great bringing it. So um, if they passed all the cars through, and in Reggie they did not. They passed some of it, maybe all of it now, but they took a long time and they passed none of it through. So we don't really know. So this is a worst case scenario. Worst case is they pass it all through, and it would be four or five cents more a gallon of gas. And that would raise, let's take the four cents, that would raise between 18 and 20 million bucks that comes back to them. It doesn't really raise it, the region raises it, we would get back 18 to 20 million bucks. Now just to kind of follow these numbers. If we just raised our gas tax right now, four cents, that only raises 12 million. So we are likely to get back more money than Vermont puts in. Kind of a no-brainer uh, tax dollars. I, I appreciate that explanation, and I, I feel like I don't get enough uh, of that when I read the news. And a lot of times, if I read it, uh, a letter to the editor in the newspaper, for example, be, oh, they're going to tax us, and we have to pay all this money, but I don't hear enough about the money coming in and what that's going to go for. 
And I think that would be an important message to get out there. That actually will, will be determined by the legislature. Uh, and, and I think I'm going to say this, that if the governor does not do this, we're going to try to make him. And that's the legislation that will have to do. Okay, and Chairman will be our last question. Hey guys. Um, so, from what I've gathered, uh, like you guys talking about Governor Phil Scott's uh, speech today, um, it, it sounds like there's still difficulties in, in collaboration uh, between like, the House and, and him. Um, and it, there's a history of that. I'm curious, I'm not sure who of you want to take this, but I, I'm, I'm curious if things have improved, like if, if there's been like, improvement in, in you know, that, that collaboration. If there's any feeling of that, sense of that. Between the legislature and the governor? Yeah. You know, I would say that we, the relationship is great compared to where it is in other places across the country, and that if the speaker of the pro tem wanted to sit down with the governor right away, it would happen. I think the lines of communication are open. I think our challenges are that our vision and values on when it comes to issues like climate change, we're very far apart. And my concern is when he comes to the table already with parameters to say, I'm really interested in talking with you about this issue. Just know I'm not going to support anything that raises a tax. And I, well, you know, we got to come to the table and know that we're going to have to compromise. And it's true that we have our guardrails on what we're willing to give up or whatever, but I mean, the long term costs of climate change are huge. And to just to put that barrier up right away is just not helpful and it's, it's not going to help our economy and if he's only looking at this through the eyes of the economy, um, that, that strategy is not going to work. And so I will say that, you know, when things get really tough, I think that we are going to try to keep at least our, our chambers and where we are in the governor are going to do all of our best work to come to the table and be civil and have that conversation. Um, but like I said, I think when it comes to um, issues like pay, fuel, and leave, and minimum wage, and climate change, um, we're just very far apart from where we are, so we have work to do on that. I would just add that in, in, in my first year, which was his first year as governor, I believe it was in his opening speech when he said to us, I want you all to go, I want all of your school boards to create a new budget and have a special election and cut money. So it started out with like, I'm not going to raise taxes. You're going to go back. We're going to have a new election and completely, you know, gut your school systems. I'm going to, was that the year with the help? Yeah. I'm going to force a health plan on teachers. And then he vetoed the budget. And, and so the tone I got from this speech was different. It was softer. Um, it was more, it was, it was a more human appeal to us. Stories of Vermonters and their struggles, which we can all relate with. Um, so the sense I got from this speech is that the problems that we're concerned about are the same. And, 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 there's, and, and what we want um, in terms of like an outcome, in a very broad sense, is the same. Like we want people to, to thrive and to be healthy and happy, and we want fairness and equity. But where I see some challenges, and, and this is both in his speech and in dealing with the administration, is that there's a philosophical difference um, that's very deep. And for me, uh, this is just speaking as myself, that one of the fundamental problems of our way of living is that when we talk about the economy, we don't take into the equation the, the full picture of the impact of cost on people and on the planet. And until we do that, we're gonna fall short. And I feel like that's totally missing from his narrative um, on, some, like, on some fundamental level. So my estimate is that it might be more peaceful, hopefully, but I don't know if we're gonna see much progress with him. And ultimately, as nice as he might be, we may need different people in that, in, different people in the administration to really make the progress we need. That's just I think just really quickly, a lot of his speech focused on values more than actions, and a value he talked a lot about was the middle. He kept talking about how we need to reclaim the middle. Um, and I get that of the political spectrum, I think is what he meant. And he talked a lot about compromise when we, when we, couldn't, when we couldn't find consensus, and that is part of the process. 
But when the middle is climate inaction, I, I just think like we have to stand up for what we believe in. You know, that's our job. She has spoken. <laughs> I don't know if everybody got that joke. <laughs> Do you have any last comments or? I'll, I'll just say that in the Ward 1A MPA, they asked last month for, for legislators to be a little more communicative. So I wrote a really long two-part update and posted it on Front Porch Forum. And you all may not get it because the way we're chopped up. But if anyone wants it, we didn't get it, I'm happy to send it to you. And that's just my own update. And, it was lovely. Oh, thank you. And I, I, I'm speaking for myself, but I, I get the sense that everyone would agree that we that I would like to hear your priorities. I know we talk about a lot about what we're working on and what we're interested in. But even if we disagree, I want to know. Um, and even if you're not in my like carved out gerrymandered district, you know, ultimately, like we represent the people, and that's really broad. If I could just um, answer your question quick, quickly. Uh, shortly after the governor's speech today, I went in to his office and spoke to his DSI and told her I'd like to speak to the governor and I came out just in five minutes. And what I'm going to say to him, and I've known him a long time. I was lobbying for the Marble and Canocracy Council when he first got into the Senate. And he said it today about 20 years ago, he said? Yeah. So I guess that was 20 years ago. Um, uh, I'm going to tell him if you need any political cover, if you, whatever I can do, if you sign on to the TCR. I will say whatever you want to say. I'll say you do a great thing. So, <laughs> Thank you. the finish line but if you care about them too we, we need your help and we're all in this together so thank you thank you to our state representatives and thank you to everybody who stuck it out this this late